Hello there. Hello. Hello. This is Kay Patrice Williams, and I am bringing you a special edition of Vaccinate Solano Live. I am thrilled to be here. I have something sparkly on me here. Um, I'm thrilled to be here because we're out in the community hearing a lot of mis misinformation about vaccinations, about COVID. So we were able to get an expert panel from the community. This is uh, two ladies that I've heard so much about before I just got to meet them. And I'm gonna bring them on live now. Hold on. We have Dr. McNeil. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Oh, the pleasure is mine. And we have Dr. Hernandez. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, too. Happy to be here. It's, it, the pleasure is mine. The pleasure is mine. I uh, I've, I'm proud to, one of the things I do is run a team of outreach specialists that gets information out in the community about um, COVID-19 and vaccinations. And we were having a team meeting and I was pretty startled. Um, the information that we were getting in the community. So we wanted to put uh, get you all here with us um, so that we could just ask the questions to the doctors. And on top of that, I think, um, uh, is it you, uh, Dr. Hernandez, you, you had COVID? Yes, I did. Okay. I actually, okay. I'm, um, I'm not you know, let's... <laughs> But I wanted so I want to hear your story, but I want to give the bios so that oh, everyone yeah. knows that uh, we have a powerhouse panel here. Um, <laughs> I am going to start with you, Dr. McNeil. Dr. McNeil is a graduate of uh oh, Mahere, uh, Mahari, Mahari Medical Mahari College, Mahari Medical mm -hmm. College, and completed her. Um, residency at the Children's Hospital of Oakland. She is a pediatrician at Kaiser Permanente in Fairfield and became the first assistant physician in the and in chief for cultural responsive care and inclusion in 2020. She is passionate about the community work and has served as a physician lead for the volunteers and public service program since 2016 outside of work. She enjoys spending time with her husband and their two energetic young daughters. You know, I just had a visual of little girls just <laughs> running you wreck. Yes. <laughs> That's accurate. <laughs> uh, so Dr. Hernandez was born in Central America, moved to the United States at age 17, first generation college student in the United States, obtained an associate of arts in biology from Miami, Miami Dade College, graduated with a bachelor's degree in biomedical sciences with a minor in criminal justice from the University of South Florida, um, was a midwife for 10 years in, low, in a low income hospital um, in Mexico and offered services for free before going to pharmacy school. Graduated with a doctor of pharmacy from Turo University, California College of Pharmacy. Currently the pharmacist project manager for Turo Cares, MVP, um, Child and Adult Resource Education Support Mobile Vaccination Program, and principal cl clinical, clinical pharmacist on duty for, at pop-up clinics. 
Wonderful. You two are exactly who we need to talk to. Exactly. So for those of you all that are watching us live, I know we always say the power is in a replay, but if you're available, you're watching, um, please share this uh, this feed onto your feed. Um, comment if you have any questions, we can see your comments. Um, but with that, let's get started. And my first question Dr. Hernandez, is is COVID-19 even real? It is, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> um, actually, it's one of the things that I wish uh, nobody would go through. Um, sure. After surviving COVID, I actually had critical COVID. I was hospitalized to the point of intubation. Uh, I went into so much pain uh, that I was, I, I even wish that I didn't make it at some point. Um, it was very, very sad to be alone in a room, even me with the higher uh, understanding of at that moment of the disease. Um, it was really hard to kind of cope with what I was leaving. Um, it's hard to say goodbye to your mom because you don't know that if you're going to make it the next morning. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's real. It's, it's difficult uh, to be in that position. And that's the reason why I accepted to be here to show my story because um, I don't want people to go through what I went through. Um, mm -hmm. Even with my my level of education, it was a hard experience. So I cannot imagine a person going through this experience that not having the full understanding of at least the medical um, process that is going on, that you're going through. Mm. So um, because unfortunately, I had to ask you that question because. There is a segment of the community that they don't feel that COVID is real and um, they don't understand, uh, I think it's called long tail COVID, those after effects yeah. of COVID. Yeah. And, um, and they feel like the numbers, when they're talking about the numbers, they equate it to a cold, they equate it to the flu. And th th there just seems to be not a clear understanding of um, what this is like to have. Um, so you were in the hospital. Yes. You were in the hospital. Um, is that worst case scenario? Like what is the, um, what does COVID look like in different ranges? It's it's different. Like in my case, when I got COVID, I was told that it was going to be a ride in the park. Uh, I was sent home when I started feeling the shortness of breath. I was told that the anxiety was the one that was going to kill me, not COVID. I was really, really bad, to be honest with you. Um, I yeah. went home and uh, I actually went back uh, to the emergency room and I pretty much um, demanded to be seen by a doctor because I even brought my pulse oximeter with me that you used it to see your oxygenation. And I told them, look, it's 85. You need to do something about this. Mm -hmm. I actually passed out on the ER um, and I, I actually made it on time because, you know, I told my family I need to leave now. And um, and it, it was a bad experience. In my, in my case, I went from being okay to worse in a couple of, in a matter of uh, two days. And um, it went, in, instead of getting better, I, it, it went worse, worse and worse and worse until I couldn't even decide on my own. Um, I was, I lost consciousness uh, at one point, I caught it uh, on October 25th. Um, I did not want it to be intubated. I, that was a decision that I made because like I said, I have a higher understanding of uh, what it was going on. And I, I didn't want, I, need, I knew my chances. Um, I knew the odds, and I just felt that if I was going to be integrated, it was just for my mom to say bye to my to my body, but I had already made peace with that uh, the night before, uh, and it, it's hard. I mean, and I've seen people in my own family where they only have like a cold, they, only, they lose their smells, they use the taste, and they have like a flu, but in my case, I was not lucky like that. So I think uh, actually a lot of my family members, they understood about this disease, how serious it was, and they stopped joking about it. Mm. Once they saw me that um, I was uh, with the high flow oxygen, I was with uh, more than 70 liters. I know Dr. Mac Dr. McNeil uh, knows about it. Like I was with uh, more than 70 liters of oxygen at, at some point. And 
it was hard. It I was hallucinating. I felt that I wasn't gonna make it. Um, mm. I know the people are being uh, lucky, like I said, and the, in my case, that we didn't even have a vaccine when that happened. So I was really thinking that I wasn't gonna be here. So I do really feel that this is a miracle that I'm here. Um, I do believe in the power of uh, praying and. I believe in God. I think that actually has a lot to do with my uh, willpower to be here today. Mm -hmm. mm. Wow. wow. <laughs> um, uh, so let me ask you this. Are you both, how, how are you involved in the community? Are you seeing COVID patients? Are you on the testing side? Are you on the education side? How do you touch the community? Um, and, and, and what are you seeing out there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's a really great question, Lisa. Thank you for asking. So um, personally, as a pediatrician, I am um, working in the outpatient clinic there in Fairfield. Um, and that's actually the clinic that I went to as a child. So I was a patient there, was very familiar with the area, you know, grew up in Fairfield, um, so very familiar with the community. So seeing patients in the office over these last, you know, year and a half coming in with COVID symptoms or um, talking with a lot of them virtually, either on the phone or with video visits, a lot of testing has definitely ramped up these last few weeks with this fourth surge that we're seeing. So um, the majority of children typically get COVID either from their parents, their grandparents, other family members, other caregivers, people who are very close to them. Um, and then with regards to engagement in the community, uh, although fortunately COVID has not necessarily hit children as hard as it's hit adult patients, I've definitely tried to make sure that I've stayed very engaged and involved with the community um, through different outreach efforts. So um, myself and my team, um, who are working in culturally responsive care and inclusion, we've given 10 um, different COVID education talks throughout the community in English, in Spanish, in Tagalog, um, and geared towards our staff at the facility, geared towards African-American patients, geared towards Latinx patients, um, as well as patients who just, uh, you know, were, were concerned about the vaccine, multiple issues and questions that I'm sure a lot of you all have heard with regards to how quickly it was developed. And, you know, even as, as Dr. Hernandez was saying, people not believing that COVID itself was real. So just really trying to get out there and not just have that interaction and engagement with my own patients, but with as many community members as possible so that we could really try to make sure that people had the information that they needed to make a good decision and hopefully, um, you know, feel as though they were comfortable enough to get the vaccine when it became available for themselves and their family members, and even before the vaccine was available, to be able to use those precautions that we've all been using for so long to try to prevent themselves and their family members from getting COVID-19 in the first place. Right. So let's, you, let's talk more about the uh, vaccine um, kind of debunking myths. Um, uh, so one one of one of the big ones that we're hearing is that you should not get vaccinated um, uh, if you are uh, pregnant. Um, mm -hmm. Is that a myth or is that a truth? Myth. <laughs> yeah, that's that's definitely that's definitely a myth. Um, there are very few individuals who have what we call an absolute contraindication who are absolutely not able to be vaccinated due to some severe health condition or due to some, you know, allergy to one of the components of the vaccine. Those people are few and far between. The majority of people over the age of 12 are eligible to receive one of the COVID vaccines. And one thing that I really encourage people to do is have a discussion with your doctor because your doctor or your healthcare provider is the one who knows you, they know your medical conditions and they can really tell you personally, like, hey, I know you, you have X, Y, Z, these are your allergies, this is the diet you're on. And yes, th these are the reasons why I would recommend you still get the vaccine. Or if you're in that tiny percentage of people who can't, then your doctor is gonna let you know that. But um, again, those people are very few and far between. They were very deliberate to make sure that they made the vaccines with um, very few allergens so that even people who are allergic to everything under the sun, penicillin, nuts, you know, trees, grass, pollen, et cetera, all of those, you know, all of those allergens that are very common um, are very uncommon to, those people are very uncommon to be um, allergic to the components of the vaccine. 
And also, I just wanted to add regarding the vaccine. Um, the only two components that people might be allergic to them, uh, it's that we actually asked those questions. It's the polyethylene glycol, which is a, a, the component of Miralax. And the other one is polysorbate. So uh, the way that I explain it to patients when they come and they have concerns about allergies, I usually tell them the vaccine in case of the mRNA vaccines, they're actually uh, protein and sugars. So definitely regarding the the, the pregnancy, uh, I myself have vaccinated a lot of uh, pregnant women. Since I started doing this, the, the vaccination clinics, I after I got, uh, got out of the hospital, my first job was as a COVID immunizer. And uh, this is actually one of the things that a lot of... Uh, females that approached me about. And I I was lucky enough to actually have uh, wives of uh, current doctors working in the COVID uh, uh, area in the hospitals. And they actually, they uh, uh, I had a, a talk to, uh, with them. And uh, there's a study actually that was published about 32,000 uh, females. And it says that the vaccines are safe to be given to female uh, patients. And since we do, are not vaccinating babies right now, one of the ways that we actually could transmit some immunity or some protection to the babies is through getting the vaccine while we were pregnant. I've heard that. I've heard mm -hmm. that. Okay. True or for, false? Um, the vaccine um, is a form of population control um, meant to make men sterile. True or false? False. And just to clarify, Lisa, you said the last part was meant to make men sterile. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Uh, so, yes. Uh, and then, yeah, you've been talking to Lisa um, on my behalf. Yeah. Lisa is, mm -hmm. I know she's writing notes there, but yep, I'm taking mm -hmm. Patrice. Oh, I'm sorry, Patrice. So, I'm yes, um, that is very false. Yeah. The, the vaccines are not making anybody sterile at all. In fact, out of the tens of thousands of people, who went through the original vaccine trials last year who are still being followed now, many of those women during the trial became pregnant and gave birth. And many of the men also, you know, went on to impregnate somebody and um, have children. So that is definitely false. Oh my goodness. Um, another, uh, uh, something that's been circulated is that um, I don't trust the vaccine. Um, it was developed uh, too fast. It was developed in the last year. Mm -hmm. So what do you say to that? So one thing that I say to people is essentially the vaccine was developed um, very quickly because of the fact that they used technology that had already been studied over many, many years. So the technology made to use the vaccine was not new. The vaccine itself was new, but the technology that was in place was not. And there were not any type of quality control steps that were skipped or missed. Um, a lot of things were done concurrently. So typically when they, when they make medications, when they make vaccines, they do things over a lengthy period of time because they'll do step one and then step two and then step three. However, when they made the COVID vaccines in the interest of time and safety, because they knew that this was so deadly and it was killing so many people, they did, let's say example, uh, step one and two at the same time and step three and four at the same time. So all of the steps were there, all the pieces of the puzzle were there, but they were being done um, concurrently versus being spaced out um, to save lives. Yeah, also the technology is not new, like just adding to what Dr. McNeil said. Uh, it's actually it's been around for 20 years. Uh, the first time that I actually heard about it was uh, when they were using it to develop the influenza vaccine. So it actually has been, uh, we do not have, by the way, I just want to make clarification. It was just studied uh, f uh, to be used uh, for that purpose. And uh, so it's not new. It's something that it has been studied before, but it hasn't been uh, uh, put it on the market before, put it uh, out there. And we used it in this case and during this pandemic because of the emergency that we had, the health emergency. Uh, another uh, something that is out there is that the vaccine kills, that people can get the vaccine and, um, and the vaccine itself will kill you. Mm -hmm. Is that truth or false? Is there any truth to that at all? So there is, so specific to that question, I will say that there is not any, there's not any evidence that receiving a COVID vaccine will kill you. There are people will 
quote, you know, well, I saw a video or I saw an article that someone died after they received the vaccine. And what we have seen is that there are people who've had maybe underlying health conditions, um, you know, and then they passed away after they received the vaccine. But out of all of those individuals, they go back and they go through their charts. They look back at, you know, their medications and everything very carefully. And it's not been shown for any of those individuals that their death was caused by the vaccine. What we do know is that COVID-19 will absolutely can and will absolutely kill people who contract the virus. And so that's why we still encourage people to use the protection that's available with the vaccine um, so that they can be safe from possibly passing away or having a very severe course as what Dr. Hernandez described her experience was. Yes. And I'm keeping an eye yeah. on, the, on the clock, uh, uh, Dr. Hernandez. I know I know you have a hard stop. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll continue with the true and false. And then um, after when we'll tag it off to um, uh, Dr. Hernandez, when you leave, then we'll, we'll finish up questions um, with Dr. McNeil. I think that's how we'll do it. So some more, um, so Ray, I see you, I see your question. We're gonna ask, we're gonna answer that in a few minutes here. Um, so, uh, the vaccine, the other thing that people that we're hearing is that, um, uh, you, you can have the, you can get the vaccine and still, and still get COVID. And I'm smiling because I want to say it the right way. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's actually, it is correct that right now, since in my case that I'm uh, doing the vaccination program at Victoria University, California, um, you know, we actually have uh, something that I always tell the patients that at this point of the pandemic and with all the variants, our main purpose with the vaccine is not to actually uh, stop you from getting COVID, but actually if you do get COVID, it's that keep you safe. Uh, you will, will you will not get as uh, sick if you had the vaccine and if you actually do not have it. Because if you do not have the vaccine, you actually have a higher chance to develop in severe COVID, like in my case. So the vaccine, what is meant at this, pump, at this moment is to actually decrease the likelihood of you getting hospitalized, of you getting uh, really sick. So in this case, uh, you, your chances are actually higher just to stay home and look after it. After your own disease with uh, at home with your family, uh, of course, you know, doing isolation and being uh, safe in that way. But that's what we want to do right now with the vaccines. And uh, no vaccine is 100 percent a guarantee that you will not get the disease. Uh, not even this vaccine. So uh, it's still even getting the vaccine, like I said, it's just to make sure that you do not, do not get us sick. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to kind of piggyback on, on what Dr. Hernandez said very quickly with regards to the different variants that are out. So what is really in the community most prominently right now is the Delta variant, which I'm sure everyone has heard about. So that's two times more contagious than the, the Alpha variant, which was kind of like the original strain of COVID that came about. What viruses do in order to survive is they mutate. So they change themselves to make sure that they can stay alive. And they're looking for, they're always constantly looking for a, a place, a host, a human, an individual to be able to survive in and live in. And so at the point that we're at now, where we've had multiple variants come through, now we have this Delta variant that's been shown to be so much more contagious. As Dr. Hernandez says, even if you actually do contract the Delta variant, because that's what most people are getting now, you still have a very, very, very high chance of not getting a severe COVID infection um, if you've been vaccinated as opposed to someone who has not been vaccinated. The majority of the people who are currently in the hospitals across the entire country, not just in California, as well as the majority of people who are passing away from COVID are passing away um, because they've been infected with Delta and they were unvaccinated. Yeah, actually the numbers, 90, up to 90% of people that are currently hospitalized in California are unvaccinated. Mm -hmm. That's so, actually, I, I became aware again. of that number yesterday. Yeah, oh, t t tell us that number again, because there's a lot yeah. of numbers that are out there in the community too. Yeah, it's 90% uh, of people that are currently hospitalized uh, with COVID in California are unvaccinated. That's actually a number that came about the, the Department of Public Health uh, publication. They have it on their webpage that you can actually check it out. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 90%. So that's the reason why I'm very uh, 
eager to get people vaccinated. I really, the experience that I went through, I really do not want people to go through that. It's very painful. You cannot even breathe. And uh, I have told uh, about that, like you said, uh, it, it's hard. And uh, I just remember every time that I hear that number 90%, I mean, I was part of that uh, October when we did not have the vaccine. And it's a horrible experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you touched on another um, true false. There is uh, out there, there's this uh, talk that the vaccinated people are really the ones that are spreading um, the, the Delta variant. And it was, I don't really, I don't understand the thinking, but I, it's, it's out there you know, that the vaccinated are, are actually um, spreaders, um, spreading more than the unvaccinated. And there's, I, and I think the logic is unvaccinated folks, their immune systems are built up. So that's why they're not getting it. I mean, have you heard that type of talk? And what do you, what do you say? So I haven't I haven't specifically heard heard that, you know, concern that people who are vaccinated are spreading more than those who are unvaccinated. But at this point in time, again, with Delta being so contagious, anyone can spread can spread Delta, um, whether you are vaccinated or unvaccinated. If you are vaccinated, you do have a higher chance of not being infected from Delta. However, you may actually be a carrier of the virus and then pass that along to other people. And so I'm not sure if that is maybe like where some of the thinking comes with that, but you can you can spread the virus and be infected with it, um, you know, whether you are vaccinated or not, um, although you have a better chance of being protected against infection if you are vaccinated. Yeah, I actually hear it at the clinic and that's one of my teaching points to uh, with the uh, current guests that go get their vaccines that they tell me what's the point of getting the vaccine if anyway I'm going to get COVID and transmit COVID to other people if I'm like vaccinated I remove my mask and I still tell them that the reason why they did they, they do get the COVID like I, we mentioned before Dr. Manil and I uh, you do not get as sick and you could actually be asymptomatic you don't even know if uh, if you have COVID unless you actually get tested after being vaccinated so I that's what I tell them that's the reason why we still uh, ask people to be wearing their masks to be uh, very watchful, uh, washing their hands and doing all the, the isolation because, you know, right now at this pro at this moment, uh, it's really uh, hard to, like, with the Delta variant, it's very contagious. It's not like it's more deadly, like people have mentioned it to me. It's more contagious. So that's the reason why uh, we, we keep saying that that uh, that's, this is the only way that we're going to get out of uh, this that we're going through uh, okay. to getting the vaccine. And that's one of the things that we're planning and doing. And um, this is my, this is not my job. It's also my passion to get people vaccinated. You know, I really appreciate you. And I'm looking at the time. I know you have to walk right off, but I just, um, I just wanted to just take a moment to to say thank you. Thank you for all that you're doing in the community. Thank you for being um, a voice. And um, you're welcome to this platform anytime. No, thank you so much, Dr. Manil. It was really nice to meet you. And thank you so yeah. much, Chief Patrice. I really appreciate your invitation. Actually, I had to run because I have a clinic today. Uh, we actually, two of Curious MVP, will be uh, hosting a clinic with the Vallejo City Unified School District. Uh, if you, if anyone is interested in getting their vaccine and talking to a pharmacist, or sometimes we do have doctors on uh, that are on duty and we have nurses, um, we actually have all our clinics uh, posted at the SolanoCounty.com forward slash COVID vaccine. Uh, all our clinics are there since we actually also work with the city for this purpose. Okay, awesome. We will get that link out. We'll get that link out. So I want to, yeah. to just thank you. And, you know, another thing is that this job, actually, the one that I'm doing in the community, it wouldn't be possible. I just wanted to mention uh, if, if it wasn't for the Kaiser Foundation. This is actually our program at this moment to Rokir's MVP. It thanks to, it's thanks to them. So I wouldn't be doing this beautiful job if it wasn't mm. for their wonderful support in the community. Aw, thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to mention, because I know Dr. Manil is from Kaiser Permanente, so that's the reason why uh, I wanted to mention, because this is actually, uh, 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 you know, uh, real because of that, because of that uh, uh, 
support that we have from Kaiser in our communities and our school. That's the reason we have a big partnership. And uh, this is actually, I'm very proud of, like I said, this is my passion. Uh, I love uh, doing this. And the vaccines work. The proof is actually me, even though I'm wearing my mask when I'm in my, um, on clinics. I'm wearing my mask. I'm keeping myself isolated. I have been doing this job since uh, January. I've been given vaccines and I have not gotten sick again. I haven't been. Uh, so that's actually one of the things I always tell people. I vaccinated my own mom. Uh, my mom received both vaccines for myself. So actually something powerful. I would not do any to anything to anyone. I'm sorry, anything that I would not want someone to do to my own mother. So mm-hmm. that's one of the things that I also wanted to say. Uh, if, if you have the opportunity, please uh, get vaccinated. Uh, it's safe. I really do not want you to go through the pain that I went through. Um, feeling uh, uncertain, it's really hard. Like I say, saying goodbye is really hard. Thinking that you're going to die, it's even worse because you in that moment, everything starts flashing in front of you and you see all these uh, goals, all these dreams that you haven't even accomplished. And they're sad. It's 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 really sad. And I was just gra- uh, recently graduated when that happened, when I got COVID. And it wasn't because I was in a COVID party like people say that we Hispanics go to because we have extended families. I actually uh, got it because I wanted to renew my CPR license to be able to actually have my my pharmacy uh, license uh, current. So it wasn't because I was just I was just doing my job. Mm. And and that's one of the things that I say people think about the vaccine. If you have mm. any questions, visit us. Uh, Turkers MVP is always every, at least two, three events a week in Solano County. Uh, and I'm actually there if anyone wants to talk to me directly. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I, know, I know you really want to stay, but. Yes, I do. <laughs> 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 you already saw it in my face. I know. It's okay. But- it's okay. I'm just glad I had we had this little bit of time with you. Thank you so much, Dr. McNeil. Thanks so much. Okay. We'll see you. Thank and you. I hope I, I get to join again. Yes. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye now. Bye now. <laughs> so uh McNeil, the, the mm-hmm. we I see some questions in the chat. Let's go to these questions. Okay, um, sounds good. I see where uh, Lisa early on was just welcoming you um, and Dr. Hernandez to our stage. Um, one of our community leaders, um, Ray Amador Dominguez, was saying, look, you know, why aren't we promoting you know, healthy living, healthy eating, bringing up our immune system? You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's vaccinate, vaccinate, but it's not, you know, be your healthier you. Um, mm-hmm. You know, why is that? Um, mm-hmm. And I summarized it. <laughs> right. Ray, no, I, hope I, think, I did justice. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's I think that's a really great question, and I think that's a relevant question. And as um, you know, as a primary care physician and someone who is really big on preventative medicine, I think that it is really important to recognize that we never we never stopped promoting all of those aspects of health. You know, healthy eating, exercise, healthy living, um, stress relief, et cetera. But what ended up happening was we we had to go into crisis mode. I mean, when you have hundreds of people calling and emailing and and um, communicating with you on a daily basis because they're positive, they're symptomatic, they're scared, they're worried, and then you have you know a few hundred other people who are in your hospitals, filling up the hospitals in the communities. Then we had to kind of pivot, and that's what essentially healthcare did all across the country last year when we saw hospitals were, were filling up and people were not able to get in when they had a heart attack or if they had an accident or if they broke a limb because of the fact that the hospitals were so full of patients who were very, very ill with COVID. And so we had to just basically kind of, again, go into that crisis mode and not that those other things were not important, but we had to really address the thing that was the most crucial at that point in time so that we could try to stop it do some type of stopgap measures and, you know, get the hospitals to where they were open and functioning again, get the clinics to where they're opening and fun- functioning again. Um, I'm sure everybody probably knows someone at this point in time who had something that was delayed last year, some medical procedure or immunization or, you know, medical care that was routine that didn't get done last year because of COVID. And so those are the things that we're hoping to 
since the beginning of this year that we've been hoping to kind of bring back around and start focusing on again. So it's not as though we stopped talking about those or or that those things were no, no longer important, but we really had to kind of flip the switch um, because we were in a state of emergency, um, you know, as, as far as the medical community and the community at large um, was concerned. And so I, I definitely encourage everyone to still continue to do all of those health and wellness measures in addition to continuing the preventative measures that Dr. Hernandez mentioned right before she went off as far as masking, whether you're vaccinated or not, um, keeping your distance, washing your hands, et cetera, um, so that hopefully we can continue to work together and come out of this and get back to the point to where we're focusing on our general health and wellness and not everything about COVID. Right. And uh, we have another community leader, Robin Walker, um, out of Contra Costa, she says the booster. Will mm -hmm. there be a booster? Should I be worried about that? Um, mm -hmm. Can you give us any information about the booster? And Ray said yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for answering that question. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, that's a great question. So we will have booster vaccines that are available um, for the general population starting uh, September 20th. And so this is something we actually just, we literally just had an a infectious disease presentation today at lunchtime, kind of giving updates with regards to the status of the booster and specific to the pediatric population. Um, at this point in time, for people who are highly immunocompromised, so if you have very severe chronic medical conditions and your immune system is depressed, then those people are actually eligible now. So what I would encourage people to do is, you know, if you're not sure which group you fall into, then double check with your physician, with your provider, and see, you know, if you're eligible to get your booster now or if you are needing to wait until that September 20th group. Um, the other thing to add on to that is that the booster is recommended eight months after you received your final dose of your vaccine. So if you received a two-dose vaccine, either Pfizer or Moderna, then eight months after that second dose is when you would be eligible for your booster. If you receive Johnson & Johnson, which is just a one dose, then eight months after your Johnson & Johnson is when you would be eligible. So, you know, as always, check with your physician if you're not sure. Should people be, I know FDA, I believe FDA just approved, um, fully approved, if that's mm -hmm. the link, um, yes. I believe it was Pfizer. Pfizer, today, uh, hot today. off the press. Hot <laughs> off the press, hot off yes. the press. So <laughs> if you received a Johnson & Johnson or uh, or Moderna, Moderna, do you, are you left, and people are left feeling like, I, I, I got the subpar vaccine. Mm -hmm, is that mm -hmm. is that a valid feeling that people should have? You know what? I wouldn't say I would I wouldn't say that that you should sense as though you received a subpar vaccine. Um, because if we kind of go back to what I said before about those different steps that were taken concurrently, just to make sure that we could kind of get ourselves out of crisis mode. Pfizer and Moderna were approved around the same time last year. If, if memory serves me correct, I think Pfizer was just maybe a few weeks before Moderna. And then Johnson & Johnson, of course, was approved a few months later. And so these are still ongoing processes for, you know, for these vaccines for Moderna and for Johnson & Johnson. And so it just so happened that, again, I don't, I don't work at the FDA. You know, I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not sure, you know, exactly what all those different steps are that they were taking. But again, if memory serves correct, Pfizer did have their emergency use authorization approved first. And so, you know, that would stand that, you know, that's probably part of the reason why it received its full um, approval first. Um, the trials, as many people who have children probably know, for kids are still ongoing um, for kids under the age of 12, because as of right now, Pfizer is the only vaccine that kids 12 and up are able to receive. Um, and so we're hoping that the emergency use authorization for kids between the ages of five and 11 will be approved within the next couple of months, um, especially given the fact that most children have gone back to school by this point in time. So long answer to a short question, but but no, people shouldn't feel as though, you know, their, their vaccine was subpar because again, all of these studies are still ongoing for everything. As a pediatrician and a mom, mm -hmm. do you feel, <laughs> you know, or how do you personally feel, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, and I'm and not saying personally, but with, of course, the lens of your doctor, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, with, you know, our children 12 and up, 12 and 18, um, uh, 
being vaccinated, mm -hmm. you know, ready for that number to go uh, down to, you know, lower ages. You know, what what are your just what are your your thoughts about it? Do you have any concerns at all? Mm -hmm. No, I think that's a really valid question. And I'll first I'll answer the question actually with my mom hat on um, because my daughters are six and eight. So they are not yet eligible to receive the vaccine. And, um, you know, and, and, but they are eligible to go back to school. <laughs> so they'll be going back to school next week. And so just knowing, um, you know, with knowing the, the, the fact that Delta is so much more contagious and that the, there's a higher risk of them possibly being exposed just by being around other kids and other families from other households. We've been really diligent in our household the last year and a half, like really, um, you know, keeping to ourselves. I mean, I think the girls have gone to the grocery store like once. Um, in the last 18 months because we just wanted to make sure that they had that protection. Myself, my husband, um, our parents have been vaccinated. But again, with the girls being more vulnerable, we wanted to have that circle of protection around them. Um, so just knowing that that there's just kind of a higher chance that they may come into contact with something that may potentially be harmful for them um, makes me feel um, more comfortable with them getting a vaccine once it is approved for their age group. And also just seeing how diligent um, all the science and, and all the research has been over this last year and a half with regards to COVID and the vaccines and the different treatments that are available. Because again, if you think last year, like we said, all medical, a lot of medical, routine medical care stopped and had to pivot because of the pandemic, um, all research on everything else stopped because of the pandemic. So research on whatever project you can think of essentially was stopped because people were looking to see how they could help with research uh, about COVID and how to, how to treat it, how to cure it, how to stop it, how to prevent it, et cetera. And so there's been so much scrutiny done, not just in the United States, but all over the world with scientists and researchers coming together, that just that fact alone kind of made me feel more comfortable with doing something for my daughters um, that I may not otherwise have felt that same comfort level with. Um, and, and again, just kind of looking at that risk benefit analysis, like if they were not going to school, if they were just at home all day, maybe it would be a different story. But knowing that they're not gonna you know, be under my protective wing, um, and now I'm gonna put my doctor hat back on and say, I'm seeing patients five days a week. And so I'm being exposed to people who may potentially have something. And knowing that I may potentially bring something home to my children, um, again, is another thing that factors into my consideration. And just knowing that I wanna have that extra layer of protection in place for my girls. And when I come home from work, and I'm sure a lot of healthcare professionals can relate to this, I take off shoes, take off scrubs, girls don't touch me, mommy's gotta take a shower, got to make sure I kind of decontaminate myself, you know, and, and so that, again, I'm, I'm not bringing anything home, but just with that tiny inkling of a chance that something, you know, could be there, then that little bit of reassurance would be there knowing that they had that, that vaccine in place. So, so two questions, two last questions. One <laughs> is surrounding research. So I tell people, look, you have to do, you have to do your research, but the truth mm -hmm. is there's so much Weird information out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where, so where can we go to do our research? But mm -hmm. you know, we're laymen. We're 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 not brilliant doctors like you. Where can we look at information that's easy to take mm -hmm. in and understand? Right. Now that's a really great question. So um, so research. I definitely encourage people to look at valid sites so that, that you can do your own research and you can get your questions answered. The CDC updates their website very frequently um, with COVID information. Uh, but what I will say is that as someone who, again, like looking at things, not just as a physician, but looking at things through the eyes of a mom or, you know, looking at things that I'm trying to refer my patients to, um, I would say that the California Department of Public Health website is very, very easy to read, they update their information on a daily basis. They break everything down by county, by city, by ethnicity, by gender identity. So you can see any little piece of information that you wanna find for Solano, Napa counties, you know, anywhere um, for African-Americans, Latinx, um, Asian, Pacific Islanders, et cetera, that's updated daily. And it's all like right there outlined very clearly and, and very well updated. 
The other source that I refer my patients to, of course, being from Kaiser Permanente, if you text the word COVID in caps to 45356, then that will take you directly to a page with resources that I actually had the opportunity to help to create specifically for communities of color. And so, yes, so text the word COVID, all in caps, to 45356. And it will take you mm -hmm, four, five, three, five, six, and it will take you straight to a page with patient centered resources that I helped to develop with my team from a culturally responsive standpoint. So we have a really great video where we interviewed patients right after they received their vaccines and patients were sharing why they felt, um, you know, why they felt they made that decision to get the vaccine. We have another great video featuring several of my colleagues talking about the vaccines, how they work. Um, what the side effects are. And then we have a lot of really great frequently asked questions um, that are underneath those videos. And then um, towards the bottom of the page, there's a few other videos that I didn't help to create myself, but that were created from our regional um, Kaiser Permanente team, again, featuring several of our Latinx and African-American physicians. Um, and I really emphasize our communities because as Dr. Hernandez stated, unfortunately, our communities have really been very heavily impacted um, by COVID, not only with infections and hospitalizations, but disproportionately with deaths as well. And so it's it's been a mission of mine since last year to make sure that we all really had that information that we needed so that we could be informed and, and be able to get that research and feel comfortable making decisions. Yes. Okay, final question. Mm -hmm. Is, is the, the call to action the same whether you're vaccinated or not? Is the mm -hmm. call to action always wear a mask, um, wash your hands? You know, just like you were giving that protocol, my husband did this thing. He would come in from, he was an, worked at Amazon, he would literally strip at the front um, and mm -hmm. go right, you know, and put the, the, you know, wash those clothes, go right in the shot. He didn't talk to us. We didn't get close to him. Nothing. Mm -hmm. until he. So should we be, should, are we at exactly that same space, whether you're mm -hmm. vaccinated or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I would say that it is important to be in that same mindful space um, because unfortunately, as we've seen with, particularly with this Delta variant, because of the fact that you can have a breakthrough infection, even if you are vaccinated, whether you have an infection where you don't have any symptoms and you don't know it, or whether you have an infection where you feel a little ill for a few days, you can still potentially pass that along to other people. And so that's why, you know, particularly if you are unvaccinated, if you are a child, if you have children, if you're in that high risk group, um, if you have different medical conditions, you do want to make sure that you're continuing to use precautions and wear your mask, you know, do your distancing and um, wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water or use hand sanitizer. Um, and doing these things, I think if everybody is doing these things consistently, uh, and then if we hopefully we're able to kind of add that layer of that extra protection, the vaccine on top, then the virus is going to be it's not gonna be able to continue to mutate and change um, because it's not gonna have anywhere to go. Uh, and that is the way that we'll really be able to kind of combat this and keep ourselves safe, our families safe, our communities safe. You, you yeah. wrap that up beautifully. I don't know what else, unless you have another thing to add. I just, that was perfect. That was perfect to me, last words. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So no, thank you so much. And I do see, I see the, the text, the COVID, um, over there to the side, but I really emphasize, you know, please, please look at these sites that are valid. Please talk to your personal providers um, and just everybody take care and stay safe. Mm. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Yes, I thank you. you. And to our audience, thank you for 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 hanging out with us for the last 50 minutes. Um, a lot of questions were asked. I want you to share this information, share this video. And with that, have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye, Dr. McNeil. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, Lisa.